A Roman legionary takes an arrow to the knee. What happens next? For most armies of the era, your average soldier would be left to deal with it on their own. But for the Romans, they had a dedicated medical corps whose job it was to treat the wounded. Boasting sophisticated facilities staffed by highly trained doctors, the legions were the beneficiaries of the most advanced medical care of its age. Today, let us delve into the pages of this life-saving practice. From mending sword wounds, to extracting arrows, resetting bones, performing surgeries, fighting infections, and more. This is Roman Battlefield Medicine in Practice. So as we've seen with the Romans, proper healthcare is key to maintaining your strength. Now, thankfully in this day and age, we don't have to deal with arrows and swords, but there's a lot that can wear us down. For me, that means not only maintain my physical health, but also my mental health. I know this past year personally has been really tough for me. I've had several losses in the family and it's just been a real grind and a slog, especially with winter time setting in. So given all this, I've really benefited from seeing a therapist, uh, having a safe space to mull over my feelings, think things through and reflect on my own behavior. Turns out I have a lot of avoidant behavior. I can't be very emotionally available at certain times. And so there was a lot to work on and this has been you know, truly a godsend in making me a better person for myself and for those in my life. And I know just generally speaking, therapy is a side of men's health that doesn't get much coverage, so I really think it's something you should consider. In terms of getting started, I can personally attest to the fact that it takes a while to shop around and find the right therapist, and that's where today's sponsor BetterHelp can come in to get that ball rolling. BetterHelp is a platform where therapists and their clients can find one another and communicate. You can start by filling out a questionnaire to start getting matches within just a few days. Then of course you're going to want to do your due diligence to check qualifications, reviews, and just find a short list of people who you might be interested in. And if one doesn't fit, you can easily switch them around on BetterHelp until you find the right match. So if you're struggling and think you'd benefit from therapy, consider clicking the link in the description below or going to betterhelp.com invicta and you'll get 10% off your first month of therapy. And of course, best of luck to you on your journey of healing and self-improvement. Before diving in, we should recall that by the first century AD, the Roman military had developed a robust medical corps. At the legionary level, this involved a hierarchy of dozens of physicians with varying grades and specialties. Alongside them were servants and military men who acted as orderlies. These helped perform much of the grunt work whilst picking up vital skills to eventually climb their own way up the ranks. All such men were attached to a legion and could deploy with them on campaign. When battles occurred, frontline medics were there to stabilize and triage the wounded before evacuating them to the rear, where they could be cared for in temporary field hospitals. More often than not, however, the bulk of a legion's medical specialists would be housed in the main legionary base, which featured a permanent hospital, known as the Valetudinarium. It was a massive complex with admin rooms, kitchens, sleeping wards, inspection blocks, and even a surgical bay. Such facilities were kept clean by staff with architectural features to help bring in light and control the temperature. They were truly marvels of their time. With this understanding of the organizational and physical infrastructure of Rome's medical corps in mind, let us now take a closer look at how it actually treated its soldiers. Care would primarily be directed by a professional military physician. Such men had decades of experience in the practice, gained either through army or civilian work. In addition to their own knowledge, they could also draw upon the accumulated knowledge of their peers and predecessors. These were contained in medical manuals. Some of these still survive today and shall be our guides for descriptions of treatment. The most prominent among them include De Materia Medica by Pedaneus Dioscorides, a Roman pharmacologist whose five books are dedicated to cataloguing herbal and chemical remedies. 
De Medicina by Cornelius Celsus, a Roman military surgeon whose eight books provide an encyclopedic treatise on anatomy, prognosis, medicine, surgery, and other treatments. And finally, the Corpus Medicorum Gricorum, which is a compilation of the roughly 60 works by Galen of Pergamon, dealing with anatomy, physiology, pathology, neurology, pharmacy, therapeutics, hygiene, and medical instruments. With these materials in hand, let's now move on to methods of treatment. Some of the most common battlefield injuries would have been cuts dealt by close quarters weapons. In such cases, the urgent tasks of a physician attending their patient would be to stop the bleeding. The method by which this was done varied. Celsus comments on these considerations, stating, quote, The class of wound and its shape are important, for a contused wound is worse than one simply incised. Hence, it is better to be wounded by a sharp weapon than by a blunt one. A wound is worse also if a piece is cut out or if the flesh is cut away in one part and hanging free in another. A curved wound is worst, a straight linear one safest. Hence, a wound is more or less serious according as it approximates to the former or to the latter shape. But whatever the case, bandages were often a first line of defense against open wounds. These were made of plant products and woven materials such as wool, cotton, and linen. Such bandages were often treated with vinegar, olive oil, or honey, compounds which we recognize today as having anti-inflammatory and antiseptic properties. The means by which one applied the bandage was also important. Generally speaking, one aimed to wrap a region slightly wider than the wound the bandage must not be too tight so as to cut off circulation or invite an attack by gangrene. At the same time, it must not be too loose as to fall off or fail to provide support. Yet the exact balance depended on the situation. Celsus notes some important concepts to keep in mind. Quote, in winter, there should be more turns of the bandage. In summer, just those necessary. Finally, the end of the bandage is to be stitched by means of a needle to the deeper turns, for a knot hurts the wound, unless, indeed, it is at a distance from it. Larger wounds, or ones which bled profusely, however, were not to be remedied by bandage alone. In such cases, it was common to fill the opening with lint, sometimes soaked in vinegar and then apply pressure by way of a sponge. If this failed to stop the bleeding, more drastic measures had to be taken. One method would have been to apply hot metal to rapidly cauterize the wound. This proved effective in sealing off blood vessels, but came with the risks of pain, damage, and infection. Other methods known to the Romans were ligatures, whereby threads or wires could be used to tie off blood vessels. Special instruments were even invented such as arterial clamps, which might also be used to stem heavy bleeding, especially in surgery. These techniques were made all the more effective by a sophisticated understanding of the circulatory system. Indeed, it was Galen of the second century who championed its research and published works whose authority would reign supreme until the 13th century. Once the bleeding was stopped, then it was time to close the wound. Any materials, such as lint or threads which had previously been introduced, were now removed and the injury was cleaned using a variety of salves diluted in wine and made from a combination of salts, vinegar, nuts, flowers, grease, and myrrh or frankincense. Today, we would be able to identify that many of these ingredients bear useful antiseptic properties. To the Romans, however, there was no germ theory of disease with which to conceptualize this fact. 
Rather, it was the practical realities of repeated trial and error which helped guide them to such desired results. Next, stitches would be applied to help draw the skin together and allow the body to begin healing. Sutures, or special pins known as fibula, were used in cases where the wound was simply too wide to stitch yet. Here, medical manuals insist that these tools should, quote, take up not only skin, but also some of the underlying flesh, where there is any, that it may hold more firmly and not tear through the skin. As the body began the healing process, wounds would need to be protected from the environment and infection. To this end, bandages could be used as well as various other forms of dressings and plasters. These would routinely be refreshed and the injury inspected for further cleaning or treatment. Celsus again chimes in, quote, Hence, upon every wound there is to be applied first a sponge squeezed out of vinegar or out of wine if the patient cannot bear the strength of vinegar. A slight wound is even benefited if a sponge is applied wrung out of cold water. As the days went on, the ultimate goal was for the body to finally begin the scarification process, which was a sign that the injury had healed. Kelsus reports on this as follows, quote, When the time has come for inducing the scar, which must be after the wound has cleaned and filled with new flesh, first, Lint is applied, wetted by cold water while the flesh is being nourished. Afterwards, when it has to be checked, dry lint must be applied until the scar is induced. Then, plumbum album should be bandaged onto it in order to keep down the scar and to give it a colour as much as possible like sound skin. Wild cucumber root has the same property. Further. Equal parts of verdigris and washed lead mixed together with rose oil gently clean black scars. Either the scar may be anointed, as can be done on the face, or the above may be applied as a plaster, which is more convenient for other parts of the body. But if the scar is elevated or depressed, it is foolish, just for the sake of appearance, to submit to pain and medicinal applications. Such were the steps to deal with most lacerations dealt by bladed weapons. Projectiles, meanwhile, required a different set of treatments. Celsus dedicates a large portion of his seventh book to the art of their removal. He begins with some general rules before enumerating the steps for arrows, javelins, and sling stones. On arrows, he remarks, quote, Nothing penetrates so easy into the body as an arrow, and it also becomes very deeply fixed. Hence, it is more often to be extracted through a counter opening than through the wound of entry, and especially so because it is generally furnished with barbs, which lacerate more when drawn backwards than if pushed through a counter opening. When a passage out has been laid open, the flesh ought to be stretched apart by an instrument like a Greek letter. Next, when the point has come into view, if the shaft is still attached, it is to be pushed on until the point can be seized from the counter opening and drawn out. If the shaft has already become detached and only the arrowhead is within, the point should be seized by the fingers or by forceps and so drawn out. Nor is the method of extraction different when it is preferred to withdraw the arrow by the wound of entry. After the wound has been enlarged, either the shaft or the arrowhead itself is pulled upon. When the barbs come into view, if they are short and fine, they should be nipped off on the spot by forceps and the missile drawn out without them. If the barbs are too large and resistant for this, they must be covered by reed pens, which have been split, and thus pulled out carefully so as to not tear the flesh. This is what to be done in the case of arrows. He then proceeds to the case of javelins. Quote, 
But if it is a broad weapon which has been embedded, it is not expedient to extract it through a counter opening, lest we add a second large wound to one already large. It is therefore to be pulled out by the aid of some such instrument as that which the Greeks call the Diocleen Syathiscus. The instrument consists of two iron or even copper blades. One blade has at each angle of its end a hook turned downwards. The other blade has its sides turned up so that it forms a groove. Also its end is turned up somewhat and perforated by a hole. The latter blade is first passed up to the weapon and then underneath it until the point is reached. The blade is then rotated somewhat until the point becomes engaged in the perforation. After the point has entered the perforation, the hooks of the first mentioned blade are fitted by the aid of the fingers over the upturned end of the blade already passed, after which simultaneously the tool and the weapon are withdrawn. And finally, Kelsus makes notes of the steps for the damage caused by slingers. Quote, there is a third kind of missile which at times has to be extracted, such as a lead ball or pebble, which has penetrated the skin and become fixed within, unbroken. In all such cases, the wound should be laid open freely and the retained object pulled out by forceps the way it entered. However, before closing this section, Kelsus adds the following, quote, but some difficulty is added in the case of any injury in which a missile has become fixed in bone or in a joint between the ends of two bones. When in a bone, the missile should be swayed until the place which grips the point yields, after which it is extracted by the hand or by forceps. This is the method also used in extracting teeth. In this way, the missile nearly always comes out, but if it resists, it can be dislodged by striking it with some instrument. The last resort, when it cannot be pulled out, is to bore into the bone with a trepan close to the missile, and from that hole to cut away the bone in the shape of the letter V, so that the lines of the letter, which diverge to either side, face the missile. After that, it is necessarily loosened and easily removed. If the missile has forced its way actually into a joint between the ends of two bones, the limbs above and below are encircled by bandages or straps, by means of which they are pulled in opposite directions, so that the sinews are put on the stretch. The space between the ends of the bone is widened by these extensions, so that the missile is without difficulty withdrawn. In doing this, care must be taken, as mentioned elsewhere, to avoid injury to a sinew, vein, or artery while the weapon is being extracted. Once the projectile has been thus removed, the treatment we previously covered regarding open wounds would be applied. Such were the ways in which common injuries from swords, spears, and missiles were treated but battlefields were terrible environments for the well-being of bodies and many more mistreatments could befall soldiers in combat. From dislocations to broken bones, ruptured organs and other grievous injuries. In our next episode, we shall see how Roman doctors dealt with these more extreme situations, from the beds of the hospital's emergency wing to the operating tables of its surgical room. For now, you can catch script previews, download all our art, and participate in polls by supporting us on Patreon or YouTube memberships. A big thanks to the current supporters for funding the channel and to the researchers, writers, and artists for making this episode possible. A special shout-out as well to the folks at Imperium Romanum and Vaterays Milites for providing the reenactment footage. We couldn't have done it without this team and this community. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to like and subscribe for more content and check out these other related videos. See you in the next one.